that's good. I hope that's sooner than we think, too, that we will. All right, Brother Collins is going to preach for us tonight. And ask the good Lord to bless him, anoint him, give him unction, give him what we need to hear. Thank you, my brother. Bless you, brother. Well, it's so good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. Amen? Amen. I have a passage of scripture heavy on my heart. The Lord has been speaking to me about this text. And, you know, I'm going to heaven. I, I love that song we sang a minute ago. I know my name's there. Amen. It's, it's already been written down. And King Jesus saved my soul when I was a boy, and I rejoice. I hadn't got over it yet. So if I embarrass you by getting happy, just leave me alone. I'm enjoying it. But I'm concerned that not everybody talking about heaven's going. Just because you say it, don't make it so. And we're living in a day that is best described in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Apostle Paul is telling young Timothy, he said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Because the day will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in that day. I never dreamed I'd see a day where wholesale telling falsehoods as truth would be accepted and telling lies about truth would be accepted. So we live in a day, if you don't believe me, just watch the news, just a little while, just pick a channel. You can find it. And they'll, they'll exchange right in front of you. Truth for lies, lies for truth. It just seems so obvious. And so tonight I want to share some scripture with you from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, the Corinthian church, they, they had some issues that the apostle Paul had to deal with. And we get to chapter 6 and he's talked to them about settling their disputes and he comes in chapter 6 to verse 9 and if you're not standing I believe we all are amen in reverence to his word we'll read the Bible says 1 Corinthians 6 beginning verse 9 know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And before you look too harshly, and such were some of you. Mm. But, praise God, ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for your word. God, thank you that it is strong and powerful and living. God, we recognize your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And God, I pray tonight that you would preach your word to us. Just move me out of the way. Dismiss me, Lord, and you speak to our hearts. And God, I pray that we would find our hearts moved by your hand, moved by your word, that we would draw closer to you, and that we would tell a lost world the good news about you. And God, if there's somebody here tonight that doesn't know you, I pray you'll draw them unto yourself that they'd come into a right relationship with you and they'd be saved. Lord, preach today. Preach to us. And may all the praise, honor, and glory be credited to Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So I'd like to talk to you about inheriting 
the kingdom of God. Because that's what these verses talk about. Inheriting the kingdom of God. Who's going to inherit the kingdom of God? I, I wrote this down because I, I read this um, and it just, it just, it resonated well. And so I'm going to share it with you by a certain commentator, A.C. Thilson. And he said this, Paul is not describing the qualifications required for an entrance examination. He is comparing, listen to me, the habitual actions which by definition can find no place in God's reign for the welfare of all. There is no place in heaven for un righteousness God is holy matter of fact he's holy 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 and there cannot be unholiness in his presence there can't be unrighteousness in glory and so those who are habitually practicing unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God well now Brother Rock, this sounds like you're about to judge everybody. I'm not judging anybody. I, I am not the judge, friend. I am not, do you hear me? I can't tell you, I can't tell you what God knows. He knows more than I do. And I can't tell you how he judges because he is the judge. But I can read his word. So he says right here, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he writes, know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. There will not be unrighteousness in the kingdom and there will not be those who habitually practice unrighteousness who get into the kingdom. He gets very specific. You all understand now why this text was heavy on my heart, don't you? Amen. God help you. Anyway, <laughs> when he's talking about unrighteousness, he says, be not deceived. And now he starts a list. And I want us to just walk through this list about unrighteousness. These are unrighteous activity. Understanding that there is none righteous, no, not one. Understanding that our righteousness in and of ourselves is like filthy rags. Understanding that we could never be righteous enough to stand in the presence of holy God. These are activities that are related with unrighteousness. They are unrighteous acts that constitute not being in the kingdom of God. He starts with fornication. Sexual immorality. We understand fornication is sexual immorality among the unmarried. Now, now we're going to talk about the married in just a moment, but this is for the unmarried. I am shocked and amazed in the society that we live in who promotes sexual activity as it does and our children are being affected greatly. I just want to stand before you on the authority of God's word and say to any of our single folks, young, middle-aged, or as old as me, it's not okay to have sex outside of marriage. Well, I don't think you should talk about sex in the pulpit. Well, where are you gonna hear it if we're not gonna speak truth here? Because our world says it's okay to go shack up for a while before you get married. That's not what the word of God says. Word of God said that's an unrighteous act. He moves from fornication. He says, uh, nor will there be idolaters. Now, what are idolaters? Don't confuse it with adulterers. These are idolaters. And that is the worship of idols. What's an idol? Let me help you. Anything you worship that's not God. We can make, 
We can make a lot of things an idol, can't we? Preacher, just stay over there in fornication. No, 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 we, we need to get over here to that idol. Because we got too many folks who got too many idols. I mean, the Ten Commandments say, there shall be no other gods before me. You ever wonder why every seat in the house of God is not full? Because I know it's not because there's not enough people in Knox County to fill it up. I'm wondering, could it be that some folks find things more important, more important than God? It's not kept for just men or just women, but for all people. If we're not careful, we will allow things to come into our life that will take the place of our God. And our God's a jealous God, and he doesn't share the throne of your heart with anyone. Idolaters, unrighteous acts that will not be in heaven. How about adulterers? That's extramarital sin, sexual sin. So we're not supposed to have sexual relations outside of marriage and then once we're married, it's one man and one woman for life. Anything else we find right here is it comes to sexual relations outside the marriage bed is adultery. It's an unrighteous act. Effeminate. Let me read a verse of scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse five. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Romans, I'm gonna save Romans for a minute. Okay, I won't. Look, it says, nor effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind. I don't want to get two, these two together too much, but I'm going to because they address issues of our day. I don't understand a man wanting to be a woman and a woman wanting to be a man. And I surely to the Lord don't understand looking at a child and saying you can choose. God already decided. In Genesis, the Bible said he created male and female. What else you need? Well, you know, today we need to understand. I must not have read that in Genesis. In the beginning, he created male and female until the 21st century when we need to decide, where does it in there? Trans whatever. It's not of God. It is not of God. He speaks of effeminate and then he speaks of those who do harm to themselves. Now, if you, if you study that a little bit, you'll find that even some translators, they do not write, even as King James wrote and said, abusers of themselves with mankind, they just go ahead and write homosexual because that's what that is. That's abusers of mankind to themselves. God didn't create Men for men and women for women. That's what it says in Romans chapter one. He turned them over to a reprobate mind. Why? Because man exchanged his natural affections for a woman to man. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, I, I am not angry with homosexual folk. I'm just telling you, it's not godly. It's not righteous. It's not of God. It's not acceptable by God. And it never will be. According to the word of God, it is an abomination. You want to know where we are? Go back to Romans 1. What did he do? He turned them over to a reprobate mind. And I've studied this. What does it mean to be turned over to a reprobate mind? And the best I can find is to be turned over to a reprobate mind means this. You can no longer differentiate between right and wrong. That's 
why our society has exchanged truth for lies and lies for truth because God has allowed an abomination to fall upon them because they can no longer and I'm not just talking about those who are practicing homosexuals. Anybody who affirms that is saying that's not truth what God said. I can't find anywhere that God said my word changes. I can't find anywhere where the Bible tells me that there will come a day when under his blessing you can exchange what he said for what you think. I haven't found that anywhere. I'll tell you what I have found. I have found his word is settled in heaven. I have found that the grass withers and the flower fades, but his word will stand forever. It is settled, my friend. What God said, that's what he meant. Well, I don't like that. Isn't it just a pity where our world is? We're, we're having debates about letting boys compete in girls' sports. What? The Bible said he'll turn them over to a reprobate mind. And they can no longer differentiate between right and wrong. Hey, I know you've heard it before, but I'll say it again. God did not create Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve. Well, you know, God had to evolve. No, he didn't. He doesn't evolve. He is. I said he is. He always has been, and he always will be. Before there was anything, he was. And when there's nothing else, he will be. Amen. Is anybody with me yet? The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on. He goes on and he says, nor thieves. <laughs> wait a minute. 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 Surely he didn't put that in there with those sexual sins. I mean, just still a little something, a little five finger discount. I was pastoring in Louisiana a number of years ago. This young boy, he was a foster child in one of the homes in our church, and he came out, and uh, he called me father. I knew he hadn't been raised Baptist. And I said, son, you don't have to call me father. But he came out again another day, and he said, father. I said, yes. He said, forgive me, for I have sinned. <laughs> I was just feeling really uncomfortable with that. But I, I said, son, what did you do? And he said, well, you know, I did a little five-finger discount. So I picked some stuff up that wasn't mine. You know what God calls that? Unrighteousness. That will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, now, we don't steal. Look at us. We don't steal. But should we get to Malachi chapter 3, the prophet said, will a man rob God? And the people say, oh, no, no, no. But yet, you are in your tithe and offering. We may need to just camp here for just a minute. All right, we won't stay long, just for a minute. All right. But a tithe is one dime out of every dollar you earn. It's a tenth. I always got tickled, Pastor, when folks would come and sit down with me after I preached on tithing. They'd say, Pastor, I'm just struggling with this. I, you know, we're tithing about 6%. I said, pardon me, we're tithing 6%. I'm like, what do you mean you're tithing? You can't tithe 6%. The, very t the term tithe means 10%. You can say, I'm giving 6% and I'm stealing the other four. <laughs> Amen. Can I be honest with you? I'm just going to be very transparent. I've had people set in my office before as their pastor, and they'd say, Pastor, we're doing everything we can. We can't make finances meet, and I, we just cannot bring 10% to the church. And I look at them, and I'm tempted. 
to say, well, it'll be okay. But God would never let those words come out of my mouth. And I would say, I understand. And I, I, I get it. But won't you just try? Because that's what he said to do. Try me and see. It's the only place in text he tells us to test him. Test me and see. Amen. And so my response now is, I, you may not can't afford to tithe. I can't afford not to. Amen. One dime out of every dollar. If you don't tithe, you're a thief. I don't like that. Well, you can get glad in the same britches you got mad in because that's just truth. Amen. Now, some folk, some of y'all going to say, well, okay, I tithe, but you still lie. Because on your check down there in that memo line, you put tithe and offering, and you're just tithing. You lied. Because you can't give an offering until you give a tithe. The tithe is a requirement. The offering is your gift to God. Amen. Amen. My daddy taught me how to tithe. I had my first job working at a grocery store. A man in our church owned a grocery store. My daddy got me the job. I'm a teenager. I go in there, I'm bagging groceries, which is an art that has fallen by the wayside. I got my first check. My daddy came pick me up. I couldn't drive. He picked me up. I said, whoo, daddy, I got paid. He said, that's great, son. I'm so proud. He said, now you know where 10% of that goes. See, in my pocket. I know exactly where that goes. He said, no, 10% of that goes in the offering plate. Said, oh. <laughs> he said, now you don't have to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I got you the job, and I'll get you out of the job if you don't. I believe I can find 10% to put in the plate on Sunday, amen. And then he said, now, you know, you got to give an offering on top of that. To which I responded, how much is that? <laughs> to which he responded, well, that's based on how much you love the Lord. I said, so that's the rest of it. That's all of it. He said, you got it. <laughs> my oldest son got old enough to cut grass and my neighbor needed somebody to cut their grass and they hired him. He came in after his first payday. I said, now you know where 10% of that goes. <laughs> Amen. It worked. Amen. My two boys tied to this day. Amen. Hey, you're a thief if you don't tithe. Well, you're a legalist preacher. No, no, I'm not a legalist. But I do believe the word of God. And I'll tell you this, you'll never outgive him. And you'll never do without if you do what he said to do. There's something wonderful about the fact that God blesses obedience. And by the way, while I'm there, before I move on, God loves a cheerful giver. Hey, Amen. Woo, get happy when you give. Amen. We better move on. We're not going to get much help there. And so he's talking about the unrighteous and he says, nor thieves, nor covetous. Now, surely that shouldn't be included in this list because coveting is just desiring what somebody else has. Now, I know none of us ever do that. Because your neighbor pulled in in a fine new Cadillac, you never sit there and like, mm, I sure wish I had that. We, we don't do that. We're happy with that old 1960 piece of junk that we have. Amen. Right? We never covet what somebody else has. It may be things, it may be people, but we wish we had what other people have. Had. We covet. We desire it in our heart. Do you know what the Lord calls that? Unrighteousness. Surely not. Me wanting what somebody else has, surely yes. It's unrighteous. 
then he goes on and he says, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards. Pastor, sometimes I look at my wife and I'll say, baby, I think we're the only two people in the world that don't drink. You ever feel that way? I mean, Lord, I don't want to go to Medlin. Help me not to go to Medlin. But it just bothers me when you got a good place to eat like the Cracker Barrel and they go to serving alcohol. I don't understand. You can't even walk in a place anymore that's not serving alcohol. It's crazy. Our world is addicted to it. And our world's full of drunkards. Let, let me help you with something. There's never been a drunkard that never took a drink. I say what I'm about to say with all glory to God, I've never had a drink. Don't ever plan on taking one. Thanks be to God. You know what the Bible calls that? Drunkards? Unrighteous. Nor revilers now you, you may not be used to that term revilers so I'll, I'll help you uh, it's defined as one who destroys others with their tongue we in the Baptist church call that gossips Amen, bless your heart. You say, preacher, now you're just about to go meddling. You're going to talk about gossip. And well, we're going to talk about it. Because the Bible said that's unrighteous. Do you know what the Bible teaches us? If you have a problem with somebody, according to Matthew 18, you're supposed to go to that somebody and work it out. If you can't work it out, then you need to take a couple people with you from the church to work it out. If you take some people with you and you can't work it out, then you bring them before the church and work it out. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you that's what Matthew 18 said to do. Hello? But you know what we do. We get us a little group. Do you know what they said to me? And so we get huddled up and we get our little huddled masses together and so we're just going to run things and we're going to say what we want to say and we're going to talk bad about people. God said it's unrighteous. He said there will be none of that in heaven. Watch who you're talking about. Some of us say, when we go to the Ten Commandments, oh, thou shalt not kill. Well, I'd never kill anybody, but yet you have sliced and diced people with your long lapping tongue. Yeah. Yeah. God help us. Yeah. Brother, I, I used to pastor too. I know what you was talking about, a little fearful and opening that box. Yeah, yeah I understand. Amen. Amen. Somebody left me a note one time I was pastoring said, I'll kill you. <laughs> Amen, I handled it real well. <laughs> I stood up the next Sunday and I said, I got your note. And I said, first of all, I want you to know you're a coward. You couldn't even sign it. You're a coward. And I said, number two, I forgive you. And the Lord will forgive you for having such anger and hatred in your heart. The Bible said revilers are unrighteous. They'll not have a place. And then he goes and then he goes on and he says, nor shall inherit the kingdom of God. The word that was used, I'm sorry, is extortioners, but it means revilers or those who are speaking untruths. Shall, none of these shall inherit the kingdom of God. Extortioners speaks about swindlers. Swindlers, what are extortioners? Thieves who steal indirectly. They're manipulative. I know we don't have any of those in our society. The Bible says those are acts of unrighteousness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe this is an exhaustive list. But I do think you get the idea. Amen, do you? You with me? Are you with me that God calls some things wrong? Do you understand that in God's economy there is righteousness and there is unrighteousness and he draws that line sharply? There, there's no gray area. Well, I'm kind of in between. No, 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 you're not. 
you're one side or the other. And when we talk about inheriting the kingdom of God, I don't know any plainer way to read it than to read it like this. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So who will? Who will inherit the kingdom of God? I submit to you, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the righteous will. Now stay with me just a minute because right now, many of us are already thinking, thanks be to God, I'm not in that number. And we look down our long hypocritical nose at those who participate in such activities and they're below us because we're just better than them. And I got, friend, I got, I got news for you, friend. And such were some of you. And if some of you say, well, I've never done anything in that list. Well, isn't that special? Your righteousness is still like filthy rags and you're undeserving of heaven. Don't talk to me that way, preacher. I'm telling you the truth, friend. I'm telling you the truth. Our world will say, well, all good people go to heaven. All good people don't go to heaven. Heaven's not for good people. Heaven's for saved people. And hell is not for bad people. Hell is for the unrighteous. And such were some of you. Everyone who inherits the kingdom of God because they have been stamped as righteous are righteous for one reason and one reason alone. They said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior and I believe Jesus died for my sin. I believe he rose from the dead. Come into my heart, forgive me my sin, be Lord of my life. And on that day, God himself took and made a deposit of righteousness into your account that was bankrupt and he made you righteous. And if you're righteous because he made you righteous, that's the only way you're ever going to be righteous. Amen. Well, I think I'm pretty good. You're not. Amen. Well, I'm not as bad as that list. You are. I can take you to another list in the text and right in the middle of it saying some of these very same things. He includes in there being disobedient to parents. Hello? God takes right and wrong serious. And he's serious about living righteously. And the only way to be righteous in the eyes of holy God is to have his righteousness imparted to us. Praise be to God. It, it don't make sense. It, it ought to be, you gotta do something. You do, you've got to believe him, amen. He did the work. And he and he alone is righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. Well, how could we ever be pronounced righteous? I'm glad you asked because he says here, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. Praise be to God. I'm glad to tell you that though my righteousness is like filthy rags and though I'm dirty and filthy and undeserving to be in the presence of holy God, I'm glad one day he washed me. I said, he washed me. The Bible said in Isaiah 1 and 18, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. I'm glad I serve a God who can wash the dirtiest of sinners. Titus chapter three and verse five says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm glad he can wash us of all of our sin. Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not what I used to be because I've been washed in the blood of the lamb. Yeah. You're not what you used to be because you've been washed in the blood of the lamb, amen. 
Amen. And not only that, he said, you've been washed, but he said, but you're sanctified. What does that mean? What does it mean to be sanctified? Well, some say that being sanctified means you're living above sin. But the only way to do that is to rent your room above pool hall. Amen. Some of y'all don't even know what a pool hall is. Here's a good definition for you, sanctified. It means being holy inwardly and righteous outwardly. It means he's done a work in you, he washed you, and now you live like it. Now, now I, I've been saved, thanks be to God. I, I, there's another word he uses right here we're about to get to called justified. Amen, just hold on. And after I was justified, I began the process of sanctification. Now he's still working on me, amen. I said he's still working on me. You know what the conclusion of sanctification is? Glorification. You know when that happens? When we see him, amen. So some of you who walk around here and think you already sanctified, mm, bless your heart. Pride, oh Lord. And so we've been sanctified. We're in that process of him working on us inwardly to have holy lives that we will express it outwardly in righteous living. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. He's a new creation rather. The old has passed away and the, old, and the new has come. 1 Corinthians 1, 2 says to the church of God that is in Corinth to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to, to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. The apostle Paul is telling us that sanctification comes as a work of all my God in our life. If you are in process of being sanctified, it's because you've been washed and you were washed, listen, and when you were washed, you were pronounced justified. That's what it says right here. He said, you've been washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. What, what does it mean to be justified? Well, that's our new standing with God. I said, that's our new standing with God. See, before, before Jesus when he looked at me, I was a sinner. But after Jesus, when the Father looks at me, he sees me through Jesus. Is anybody here? This is my new standing. I've been, it doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I didn't sin. It just means, and such were some of you. Lord help us, Galatians 2.16, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Did anybody hear that? Man is not justified by works of the law. We have folks today who believe that if you don't keep the law of the Old Testament, you're not righteous. I got news for you. There's not enough works in the Old Testament, New Testament, and planet Earth for you to work your way to righteousness. We, mm, glory to God, we know we're not justified by works of law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. How does that happen? How does that happen? God extends to us for by grace, he extends an invitation and by faith we receive that invitation. Boy, that's good. And as a result, I'm justified. He said, we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. It's not mm, glory, it's not by our works, but it's by his mercy, it's by his grace, it's by his blood that he shed on the cross and has imparted to us his righteousness. Romans chapter four and verse four and five, now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Amen. Let me, let me tell you what I heard one say when trying to define justification and he said it was just as if I never sinned. Yeah. Amen. Now how can that be if such were some of you? 
Who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the church at Corinth. These are believers. These are folks who are in the house of God. He's writing this letter to try to help and instruct them. He just said, and such were some of you. But then he said, you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. What does that mean? It doesn't mean we never sinned. It means we sinned. But Jesus, glory, Jesus made us as though we hadn't sinned because he shed his blood for our sin. Mm. And such was I. See, I hadn't always been saved. I hadn't always been a preacher of the gospel. I, I hadn't always been called Dr. Collins. But there was a time, as the songwriter said, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. I'm telling you, love lift. I'm not what I used to be because of Jesus the Christ. And now I want to sing with all my heart. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I got news for you today. My hope is built on Jesus the Christ. I'm thankful that he didn't leave me in my own righteousness, but he washed me in his blood. He sanctified me with his word. He justified me through faith in him. And there's no need to to even question that, that's truth. But here's the question that begs an answer. Are you gonna inherit the kingdom of God? There's only one way to inherit the kingdom of God. Through his righteousness. And the only way to be righteous is to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ and let him wash you, sanctify you, and justify you. Amen. Hey, this list of unrighteousness that is given to us in this text, we don't hate folks who are participating in those things. We don't hate them because we ought to see us in them. Perhaps that's why Paul included those words and such were some of you. Because sometimes we get on our high horse and think, oh, I'm righteous. I go to church. I'm righteous. I'm there to sing and pray. And Amen. I even walk the aisle sometimes. And none of that makes you right. Matter of fact, you don't do any of that to be righteous. You do it because you are righteous. Right. And the only way to be righteous is to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, Amen. believing in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's it. That's the only way. So if you're going to inherit the kingdom of God, it'll be because of what Jesus has done. Amen. I, I got to tell you, I, I told you all this morning. I don't know if I told you this morning. Maybe I didn't. I believe I was telling you at lunch. My youngest son is in seminary, and he's the assistant pastor to church. And um, man, I'm, I'm so proud. He he called me this afternoon. He said, "I need to tell you something." I said, "Yeah, tell me." He said, uh, "This man came to church second time he had been there." I said, "Great." He said, "We were singing a song during our song service about Hosanna," and the man said, "What's this Hosanna? What's what's his name?" and they tried to answer Hosanna and explain what Hosanna was. And then he said, well, what about all these other names of God? And so he, he and the pastor of that church are explaining, well, long story short, I'll not bore you with all the details. He got saved today. Amen. And he said, and Brooke, that's my daughter-in-law, he said she was, she was at a, a ministry project and she started witnessing to a girl and she didn't know about Jesus and said she's agreed to come to church with her and hear about Jesus. Hey, can I tell you something? 
besides me getting saved and seeing other people get saved, to see my son and daughter-in-law winning folk to Jesus, that absolutely makes me want to take a lap around this place right now. You know why? Because that's what the righteous do. Now listen, I'll shout with anybody on the fact that he has imparted his righteousness to me because I recognize above all else that I am nothing without him. I am, I, am, I am sure for hell without Jesus. But I'm sure for heaven with him. Amen. I'm going. Amen. I already made my arrangements. <laughs> Whoa, I'm glad I'm saved. And because he saved me, I'm convinced he'll save anybody. Who are you telling? So here it is. Here's your invitation tonight. Number one, if you're not righteous, tonight's the night to get righteous. How do you do that? You come by faith in Jesus Christ, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection, asking him to be Lord of your life, submitting yourself to him, making him your Lord, repenting of your sin, saying, I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning to you, the Savior. Today's your day. If you are righteous, Number one, you ought to have a little shout in your heart. You ought to have a little joy in your life. You, people ought to look at you and see something different about you. And when they do, you ought to be ready to give a testimony of what Jesus has done for you. So maybe tonight you need to come give your heart to Jesus. The altar's open. Somebody may need to come and just get on your knees and say, I just need to spend a minute thanking him that I, such was I. <laughs> just say it like it says in the book such were some of you and know that you're in the you amen and some of you may need to come and pray for somebody that's lost tonight maybe your heart's heavy for somebody that's going to hell if we'd be honest probably nearly every one of us have somebody in our own families that are lost folks Jesus is the only answer I, I, I don't know if y'all heard we have an election coming. And it would be crazy for the righteous to think that the unrighteous can fix themselves. Only our God. So I don't know what you may need. I, I don't know exactly why. The Lord would have me preach that message tonight, but I'm telling you, he told me to. And so I leave it with you. The righteous shall inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Father, thank you for meeting with us. And God, thank you for imparting your righteousness to me. For Lord God, I recognize that without you I would surely perish without you I am nothing all of my good deeds amount to nothing but thank you Lord for sending Jesus to impart his righteousness to me God, for that man or woman or young person who sits here tonight and they've never met you, I pray today will be the day. Have your way, Lord. This is your invitation. Divide it unto yourself. And we'll give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Very quietly, stand to your feet. Our brother's going to lead us as we sing. You come. As the Lord spoke to you, altars open, invitation yours. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus.
We're going to sing another stanza in just a moment. But I, I tell you what, I'm glad tonight. I'm glad tonight that there's not one of those things that were listed in unrighteous living that our God can't forgive. There's not a one of those sins that's mentioned that his blood isn't sufficient for. Not one, not one, not even close. His blood is greater still. Thanks be to God. Come to Jesus. Come, let's sing that second stanza. Come home, the altar's open. You need Jesus, come. We'd love to introduce you to him. Come on. Folks, you've heard two messages today on salvation and consecration. That's what the emphasis has been upon. And it's good because one complements the other. That's good preaching, folks. Amen, 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 amen. And you're watching a culture just disintegrate before your very eyes. <laughs> it just blows my mind. Yes, it really does. One of the senators asked a, uh, I forget who she was. She was president of a college or something. Uh, Ma'am, would you please tell me... Uh, of what a female is? She couldn't answer it, wouldn't answer it. That's where you're getting into now. You know, you can get into the DNA, XY chromosome, XX, but that's not the issue. What did God make you? How did you come into this world? And I'm not gonna change on that, folks. They can say what they please. I went to the doctor yesterday or day before and had to fill out, you know, you go in there and you have to fill out all this information and uh, you've already given it to them a dozen times. But here we are again. And then it got down to the, sec the section about sex, sexual orientation, non-binary. Uh, uh, how do you, what, what do you, what do you claim to be? What do you call yourself? And one question after another after another. And I thought to myself, this is insanity. This is pure insanity for them to take that and stick it into your hands. This kind of garbage. Amen. This is, folks. Let me remind you once again. They may, be, they may be presidents of universities. They may even be presidents. They may be your doctor, your lawyer. But if they don't know the difference between a male and a female, they are insane. That's insanity. There's no dialogue with these people. There's no arguing with these people. You might as well argue with a hound dog. There is no argument with them. There's no basis of argument. This is pure insanity. And this is, the, this is why the Bible says they're called evil good and good evil. A dokimos, you're talking about there in Romans 1. They cannot tell the difference between right or wrong. That's a reprobate mind. Amen. Thank you, brother, for the preaching. Thank you for the word of God. This has been good preaching. Amen, amen, amen. Good preaching. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have a couple of men go to the back door, and uh, we'll get to take up an offering for this, brother. I never saw a boy go into a girl's bathroom at rural high school never because if those girls had started screaming he was finished yes. you better believe he was because the boys would have been waiting outside for him and that would have been his last trip yeah yeah that would have been it it would have finished right then and right there and they never carried firearms into the schoolhouse to shoot you and blow you this is what they this is why folks they kicked God out of, out of the schools, and look what came in. All right, I'll shut up. Good night. I'm, I'm up here and preach. He done got me all stirred up here tonight. He got me all fired up. All right. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Good to, good to have you. How would you like to have him back in here? Amen. Yes, sir.
this brother lives down in Murfreesboro, and uh, that's a good place. That's, uh, he's not in Nashville, not too far from it, but Murfreesboro is a good place. It sure is. All right. Okay. Father, thank you for the word and for the minister you sent today. Father, for the message and the messages that he's given us. Bless him, unction. Bless his family, his sons that are in the ministry, Lord. Open doors for them. Pour your spirit upon them. Use them, Lord. Use this brother. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. Be careful.